Today, let us see the origin and features of caste system. The origin of the caste system was initially racial. It is perhaps when the Aryans settled in India around 5000 years ago that the Varna system laid its roots in India. These roots of the Indian caste system can be found in the Hindu scriptures. Let us see these details from our ancient scriptures, the Vedas, the Puranas, Vedangas and so on. India is known for having one of the oldest ancient scriptures. The earliest literary evidence that sheds light on India's past is the Rig Veda. It is difficult to date the work with any accuracy on the basis of tradition. In fact, the four Vedas, six Vedangas, Smritis, philosophical texts, Puranas and other literary texts are the evidence. Apart from this, the temples, cave temples, universities of ancient India, the coins, stone inscriptions, sculptures and paintings, the ruins of the old towns and metal, stones, rocks and sand also speak a lot about the culture and civilization of India. According to Bhagavad Puranas, 7th chapter, the Aryans were spread all over the globe. This is evident from the similarities in the cultural and religious practices and the languages of the Aryans to the countries in the east like Japan and Australia and the west like Africa, Turkey, Arabia, Germany and the nations in the south and North America. The countries like China and Tibet were included within this Jambudvipa only. Now, what is this Jambudvipa? As per the ancient scriptures, there are three regions, Jambudvipa, which is Asia, including Russia, Bharatavarsha, which is the whole of Asia, excluding Russia, and Bharat Kanta, which is the present day India. Kanta means divided place. Bharat Kanta was cut off from Jambudvipa and Bharatavarsha and became an independent country called Bharat. This was due to the Himalayas in the north and the oceans in the south. There is also a mention of four oceans, the Indian, Pacific, Arctic and Atlantic in the Rig Veda. One can also observe the same in the present day prayer recitation by Brahmins mentioning the same. H. C. Wells in his uh, Outline of History mentions that these oceans have existed since the good 50,000 years ago. Aryans, the Vedic people lived in the regions of Kashmir, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Turkey and Kazakhstan. India itself had 56 states. This is evident from the national anthem of India which speaks of the said states. All these states had various languages, diverse food habits and different dress codes but the common factor which united India was the culture and dharma. India's social, economic and cultural configuration are the products of a lengthy process. As per the Vedic literature, the Aryans resided on the banks of the river Saraswati and Sindhu in the Vedic age. The Vedas talk about Bharat, which was a much larger nation than present day India. Hindus in the regular rituals make a resolution specifying the place where they reside. In this particular ritual, they recite, we do this ritual in the south of the Mount Meru, in Jambudvipa, in Bharatavarsha and in Bharatakanta. Now, before it all becomes confused, let me distinguish the three. Bharat Kanta is present day India, Bharatavarsha is Asia excluding Russia and Jambudvipa is Asia including Russia. Now, this establishes clearly the Aryan community was indeed huge. Through this, it is clear that Central Asia and India were not two separate entities. In ancient India, instead they were two parts of the same entity. Though the Vindhyas divide the land into North and South India, it is still referred to as India. Similarly, though the Himalayas are between India and the remainder of Asia, they were all one under Bharatavarsha. Puranas clearly say that once the whole earth was undivided, later through the movement of the tectonic plates, the land got separated into the continents we know today. As per the Puranas, the son of Swayamvamanu, Priyavrata, ruled the entire world and divided the earth into seven continents, namely Jambu, Plaksha, Shalmali, Kausha, Kroncha, Shaka and Pushkara 
and apportioned them among his seven sons. The four Vedas form the core of the Hindu religion known as Sanadhan Dharma. It is said that the Vedas are of non-human origin and have existed since prior to creation itself. It is understood that the Rishis cognized these mantras already in existence and made them known to the world. The Vedas contain details of the life during this period that have been interpreted to be historically important and constitute the primary sources for understanding this society itself. These documents alongside the corresponding archaeological records detail the evolution of Vedic culture to be traced and inferred. The Vedas orally transmitted with precision in that period. The Vedic society was patrilineal and patriarchal. Around 1200 to 1000 BCE, Vedic culture spread eastward to the fertile western Gangetic plains. Later, the Vedic religion developed into a Brahminical orthodoxy and it formed one of the main constituents of the Hindu synthesis. Even today, it governs the lives of 300 million Hindus in several important respects. In this Hindu dharma or the Sanatana dharma, the Varna system is dharma. Shastras or the hymns in the Rig Veda divide the society into four Varnas. They are Brahmins, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas and Shudras created respectively from the mouth, arms, thighs and feet by the primeval entity, the Purusha. The caste system are explained in the early Indian scriptures and the Vedas looked at caste as occupational divisions. Brahmins were scholars, teachers and priests while the Kshatriyas were rulers, warriors and landlords. The Vaishyas were the merchants involved in trade and business, while the Shudras were manual laborers. Beyond these four basic Varnas, there are the Avarnas in the system who were outsiders and foreigners who did not conform to the system. So, several caste groups together formed the Hindu society. The integration of these units into an organic community shows the stern belief of the people about the system and they felt that it is handed down to them by their ancestors. It is repeatedly mentioned in the scriptures that each human is the image of the Purusha, the God, which would indicate that each human internalizes aspects of all the Varnas. Many texts proclaim that once nature alone and not birth determines to which Varna one belongs. It is agreed that in the ancient Aryan society, the Varnas were functional groupings and not closed endogamous birth descent groups. The Vaishnava emphatically defines Varna based on one's actions. Bhagavata Purana 7.11 proclaims clearly one's nature alone determines to which Varna one belongs. In the Rig Veda, it is found that in an Aryan society, an individual had the right to choose his profession according to his ability. One could become a priest or a warrior or an ordinary man, but everybody must do some work or other to earn their livelihood. If he must be a priest or a Brahmin, he is to be the repository of hymns and will be considered of belonging to the highest profession. He is expected to compose or decipher the hymns to control or tame the nature, must be an expert strategist and an excellent warrior himself. Hence, if a person could neither compose hymns to become a Brahmin nor become a warrior, the only profession left for him was that of the agriculturist. This profession is considered lower than the priest or warrior. This was inherited in the later tradition. There are many references in the scriptures regarding great kingdoms during that period. They constructed huge temples and donated wealth, precious ornaments, farmlands, cattle, etc. in the name of the presiding deity of the temple. There are innumerable temples in India. The temples became the center of the Indian culture. The construction of these huge temples was possible through overseas trade and business. Though the growth of these temples, culture, civilization, art and science grew, temples were the common treasure of the society and it promoted engineering, math, study of the Vedas, architecture, agriculture and animal husbandry. Whenever a temple construction started, it played a huge role in providing employment. The skilled workers, artisans and craftsmen, construction workers, sculptors, 
carvers who can carve the rocks to make temples, lime and brick workers, transporters, painters and artists who can paint colorful pictures were engaged by the kingdom. The lands donated to the temples were leased to some particular group and through that agriculture flourished and there was a barter system. The cattle donated to the temples were looked after by a particular group who were engaged in the dairy business. Another group who was well versed in cooking was engaged in preparing delicious prasad and food for the temple and its people. For the preparation of food, vessels are needed. Hence, potters who make clay pots and metal pots formed a group. For the supply of flowers for the temple and decorations for other festivals, the flower garden of the temple land was maintained by the gardeners. At once the construction was over to ensure that the employment continues, temple festivals were organized by the kingdom and local people. Special artists were engaged to regularly play musical instruments, vocal, dance, drama, etc. and they were engaged regularly during festivals and local functions. They too formed a community. Weavers were engaged to weave for the temple deity and the people. Designers were engaged to design the cloth and they formed a community. Goldsmiths and others were engaged to make various ornaments with gold, silver, diamonds, pearls, etc. for the temple deity. The people who were engaged in washing cloths for the temple formed a washer community. To clean the temple premises and surrounding, people were engaged and they formed a community. To maintain all the accounts, accountant groups were engaged and they formed their own community. The fortune tellers community wrote the panchang and read horoscopes. Hence, the temple worked like an industry that provided employment to people from numerous communities. They worked for their kingdom as well as for their livelihood and there was only a barter system. As they were nature worshippers, they maintained the greeneries, forests, rivers, cultivable fields, herbal gardens and the particular community was looking after that too. There were health practitioners or vaidya who formed a community. So the community and the village were self-sufficient in everything without oppression, exploitation or slavery. Hindu dharma, values, norms and rules were followed passionately and this can be understood by the worker who took his caste as a service to the Hindu dharma and humanity. He himself looked at the subsistence level. He was not trying to earn a living out of it. He was content with what he got because he interpreted it as God-given. And since the values of each caste were different, there was no comparison at all. They all considered their work as service and felt blessed to get such an opportunity and led a spiritually enlightened, happy and peaceful life. That is the Sanadana Dharma. People could be poor, but they still would be spiritually content and devoted. And as previously mentioned, the skilled workers and artisans were paid a good wage for their contribution to society as well. Hence, the temple became the lifeline of the villages and the kingdom and they themselves also devoted their lives to the temples and the presiding deity. The temple property belonged to the presiding deity and no one could stake the claim to it as their own. To look after the deity and maintain the daily puja, prayers and offerings and teachings, the dharma and rituals, a community that performed sacred duties was formed. For the security and safety of the land and community, a separate guards community was formed. There were several sub-castes within the Varna or caste that formed an individual endogamous group. It is in fact this division of labor and the commitment of the people towards their work that led to the formation of the flourishing society. People lived peacefully in Varna system without any problem for millennia. It was Dharma that developed this nation. Creativity and variety flourished during this age. In fact, during this age, these communities were earning their livelihood from their skilled work or vocation. It is only due to the different foreign invasions and industrialization that the collective way of life was corrupted and the invaders introduced an independent way of living. This destroyed the respective work culture, vocation, machines replaced man, they became poor, unemployed and lost dignity. Thus what were once respectable skilled communities in yester years deteriorated into a communities of lower group 
both socially and economically weak. Hence, let us reiterate that after the invasions, there was a drastic change in society. Caste was no longer an occupational division. Now, caste could only be determined by birth. As it followed the patrilineal system, the father's caste, which was his occupation before, now became his identity that would be passed down to his children regardless of their current occupation. Caste was no longer synonymous with occupation. It was as mentioned before an identity passed down by birth and birth only, patrilineally and became more of socio-economic status. By now the caste system had taken on a completely different shape and meaning with a changing time and place. Once changed it never returned to its original form. Its character during the different periods was altogether divergent from what exists today. It is still in a transient phase. It is different in the context of villages, localities, regions and religions. In its long history, India has had diverse social and religious currents. As a response to historical events, there was the emergence of the modern jati system the meaning of which has been explained in chapter 1. Because of uh, the next fundamental change in India that occurred with the invasion of the Turks in 1001 AD, they also introduced the concept of their own caste in the language Bharadari. The term Bharadari broadly refers to caste and subcaste. Many scholars believe that the system of Jati that we have now emerged only about a thousand years ago. It is seen as a direct effect of the catastrophic disruption to legal and political institutions caused by the Turkish invasions. Due to this different occupational communities created their own system of justice and governance. Caste now emerged as a rigid closed endogamous system that gave a person identity and the sense of belonging, pride and comfort in the wake of oppressive invaders. This was the beginning of the hierarchical system. In this situation, a local social structure developed which centered around the dominant community of that locale. It developed with the needs of the agrarian settlements that grew into a feudal society. Although originally there are only four varnas in the Hindu caste system, in reality there are hundreds of castes and subcastes in India which do not fit into the four traditional castes mentioned. Early occupational structure became a caste and many subcastes. Thus, the caste system became a social institution corresponding to a community's vocational name. Every vocation or occupation became the name of the caste of a person, which in itself would not be synonymous with the said person's real occupation. This could and still can be seen all over India. There is a strong opinion that the caste system did a long damage to India. In modern India, it may be true, but it must also be understood that in the feudal age, the caste system was a boon and did good to Indian society because it corresponded to the feudal occupational division of labor in society. This resulted in the great development of the productive forces at that time. Many aspects of the evils of caste system today were not present in those days. The people led a harmonious life and the system did well. Around 40 percent of the population of India was engaged in the handicraft industry or skilled workers while the rest of the population were engaged in agriculture. Society was self-sufficient even after currency took over the older barter system. It is the British who introduced the products of the mill industry into India and raised export duties on Indian handicraft products thereby practically destroying the handicraft industry in India. They never allowed to establish the mill industry in India. The British policy was to prevent industrialization, creating an economy that required their assistance to function. The result of this was millions of self-sufficient communities belonging to a particular caste either starved or became beggars or criminals due to the raising unemployment. At the end of the British rule, many in the handicraft industry became unemployed and were driven to starvation and destitution. India, which was one of the most prosperous countries in the world, became one of the poorest 
unable to feed itself. Low life expectancy, low literacy, retreat, the end of the British rule. This very concept has been explained in detail by Dada Bhai Nauroji in his drain of wealth theory during British rule in India. Post-independence, industries developed and in the modern industrial age, the demand for skilled technical personnel was much larger than earlier. Hence, the traditional feudal method of teaching a craft, especially to their children or the family occupation, extinguished into darkness. It was no longer sufficient enough for the demands of the modern society. Now, to develop a substantial number of technical skills, technical institutions or engineering colleges became necessary where many students were taught the technical skills. Obviously, all the students who studied in these colleges or technical institutions were not the sons of the communities that originally were the craftsmen and artisans of the handicraft industry. These students came from many different castes to study the same occupation purely for the sake of employment. Originally, a person from a particular caste community had the freedom of choice in terms of what their occupation could be. They could decide to stay in the occupational community they were born into or they could choose a different occupational community given that they no longer carry the name of the Varna caste they were born into. Now, they belong only to the new community. Today, the carpenter's son or the cobbler's son or a priest's son goes for education and becomes a clerk, a teacher, a mechanic, an electrician and so on. Although he no longer follows his father's profession or rather the profession that his caste was named after, still his identity of caste or ancestral profession is preserved in his certificates and in the revenue records. This is how rigid the caste system of modern India is. However, it must be kept in mind that what was valid and good at one point of time need not be so at other times. Once a factor of social identity and stability has now become an evil of the society. Now let us see the features of the caste system. The caste system is not limited to the four Varna system but developed into Jati which is a very small endogamous groups practicing occupation and enjoying a certain amount of socio-cultural ritualistic autonomy. Every Jati constitutes a caste court in each village and punishes the caste offenses. According to Professor Gure, there are around 2000 sub-caste Jati in each linguistic area. This will give a picture of the number of endogamous sub-castes in whole of India. Another interesting feature is that the Jatis occupying even the lower rugs follow the customs and rituals of higher Jati which help the spread of the uniform culture throughout the Hindu society. Prevalence of Panchang, the Indian calendar, the instruction and the guidance provided by the Vedic astronomical calculations preserve the culture. The segmental division of society. According to Hindu tradition, birth is not an accidental incident. It is believed that based on one's karma and dharma, one is born into the Varnas and family. The doctrines of karma and dharma teaches a Hindu that he is born in a particular subcaste because he deserves to be born there, which implies that due to one's actions performed in the previous birth incarnation, he or she deserved punishment or reward to be born in a lower caste or higher caste as the case may be. Hence, the membership of the group was determined by birth and not by occupation or choice. Moreover, the status of a person depended not on the wealth he possessed but on the rank that his caste enjoyed in the Hindu society. Hierarchy Each group occupied a specific status in the overall framework of hierarchy. Thus, the caste hierarchy becomes the index of the state of individual soul and justifies as to why one's good karma leads the soul's journey to God. Dharma is the moral code prescribed for everyone, especially all the Varnas. It applies to the subcaste as well and expects everyone to follow it consciously and live a harmonious life by following the Dharma or moral code. Living according to Dharma is rewarded while violation of Dharma is punished 
not only in this birth but also in subsequent births. The reward for good deed is that the person will be born as a noble with riches in a good family. If not, the person will be born as poor, deformed and ill-fated. So, the success or failure indicates the life he led in the previous birth. Everyone is expected to work and earn their living righteously with self-satisfaction and without much expectations. The status of a person depends on the rank that his caste enjoyed in the Hindu society. Restrictions on food. The Hindu society had very strict rules about the acceptance of food and drink. It is specified as to what sort of food or drink the members of one caste could accept from the members of another caste. As mentioned earlier, among the four Varnas, the first, that is the Brahmins, can accept only raw food, that is grains, vegetables, fruits, etc. from the second and third Varna, that is the Kshatriyas and Vaishyas, but not from the fourth Varna. But they cannot take water from anybody and they cannot accept cooked food from anybody. The other two Varnas, the Kshatriyas and Vaishyas, can take cooked food from Brahmins, but Kshatriyas cannot take cooked food from Vaishyas. All the three Varnas, the traditional Hindus, cannot take even water from the untouchables or lower caste, that is the fourth Varna. Normally, as a rule, orthodox Hindus will never eat cooked food unless it is prepared by a fellow caste man, which in actual practice means a member of his own endogamous group, whether it be caste or subcaste or else by his Brahmin guru or spiritual guide. In practice, most of the caste do not hesitate to take cooked food from a Brahmin. G.S. Gure gives an account in the matter of food and social intercourse, which says, In Hindustan, proper caste can be divided into five groups, the twice-born caste, second, those castes at whose hands the twice-born can take raw food, third, those castes at whose hands the twice-born cannot accept any kind of food, but may take at fourth caste that are not untouchables, yet water from them cannot be used, the twice born. Last came all those castes whose touch denied not only the twice born, but also any of the orthodox Hindus. Social restrictions and taboos in Hindu society, the untouchables became a known term in the caste system. The higher caste groups considered the lower caste groups as pollution and impure. A low caste group were not allowed to draw water from the common well or pool and they were not allowed to enter the courtyard of the temple. They could not even enter into the villages but only allowed to stay in the outskirts of the villages. The low caste groups are actually the service caste but the way of life, the unhygienic and unclean practices made the caste Hindus keep a distance. In fact, even the barber community and the washerman community who serve the general public also don't render their services to the lower caste. Moreover, the lower caste groups were not allowed to study the sacred texts and their marriage rites and other pujas were performed not by Brahmins, priests, but by the priests who were lower to Brahmins. In some parts of India, they were not allowed to wear cloths, gold jewels above the waist, not allowed to wear the chapels and not allowed to carry umbrella. They had to prostrate before the upper caste as a mark of respect. The dwelling places of the lower caste group were segregated from that of the higher caste groups and they were made to stay outside the villages. They were not allowed to mix with the higher caste people due to ceremonial purity and untouchability. Generally, all over India, the village dwelling practices are so organized in such a way that the main portion was allotted to Brahmins or the dominant upper caste and then other castes like artisan, shepherds, agriculturists, washermen, barbers and last the untouchables in the outskirts of the villages. The choice of occupation. Basically, the choice of occupation by the caste group is hereditary. It is their birthright to pursue their own hereditary occupation. The Brahmins were involved in conducting rituals, educating the people, acting as advisors. Their children followed the same occupation. Governing the state, collecting taxes, protecting them, engage in warfare or the duties of the Kshatriyas and they trained their children in the same profession. 
business and agriculture are the occupations of Vaishyas and their children had the right to follow their parental profession. Serving all the three groups are the jobs of Shudras and their generation followed their hereditary jobs. It is expected that all castes classes should have a sense of commitment to their own jobs. They should not covet or crave for others job. This was only to maintain the occupational balance so naturally the children followed their own hereditary occupation. Intercaste marriage was not encouraged but if it happens it was not a crime in the ancient society. Through intercaste marriage mixed classes and mixed occupation happened. So the jobs like temple priesthood art of expounding Puranas, driving, carpentry, jewellery, architecture, painting, weaving, medical science, music and dance were performed by mixed classes. The people who could not fit into it or did not do anything became uncivilized and considered outcast. For example, the true Brahmins were not permitted to rule the country nor permitted to make their livelihood through any other work except their prescribed work mentioned above. But various socio-economic changes and industrialization brought in changes in the traditional hereditary occupation. For example, the Brahmins took up different kinds of profession. For example, they served in armies, worked as messengers, involved in trade and industry, plowed the fields, offered their services to other landlords, entered administrative services, etc. Similarly, other communities, Varnas, also engaged in agriculture and other occupations. But only Brahmins never allowed others to be priests in the temples or doing the rituals. This may be due to the Vedic education knowledge or rituals that are required to preserve and practice sanctities while observing the Agamas rituals of the temple. The other caste people were not allowed to learn Vedas but had the exposure to other education, medical education, technical education, law, artistic field, administration, etc. Now, the marriage restrictions. In Hindu society, endogamy is the essence of the caste system. Marriage between the four Varnas castes are prohibited. There are so many sub-castes inside the caste groups and the marriages are restricted to the concerned sub-caste only. In some places like Punjab, a higher caste male could choose his woman from a lower caste. In Kerala, Malabar, the son of Nambudri, the Brahmin priest, and other Brahmins could marry girls from Nair caste, the Kshatriyas. So in some places, hypergamy had also been encouraged. Generally, the caste laws are so strict that the violation of these laws resulted in expulsion from the caste. The Brahmins and other high caste groups confined marriages to their own groups only. The subcastes also are so distinct from one another that they hold no direct social intercourse with each other by marriage or by eating or drinking together. Thank you.